inviting all experiences, inviting uh, the experiences that you have as a human being in your physical body, uh, in this life, rather than pushing it away and just focusing on some sort of spiritual goal all the time. So in the tantric path, we're, we're in the human body and we're accepting that and we're uh, allowing things like our emotions, our sensations, our experiences in life to be part of our journey and part of our meditation and mindfulness and a part of our practice, really. And welcome to Curious Ones Podcast by Andara. I'm Yael Ginsberg, the host of the podcast, a yoga and meditation teacher and philosophy lover. Each week you will hear eye-opening interviews with the different teachers of the Andara Yoga Institute located in beautiful Baja, Mexico, along with other teachers that pass through here. This life-changing knowledge shared through authentic, heartfelt communication will help you live a happier, more fulfilled, and connected life. Let's dive in. I'm so honored to have my personal teacher today, Nicolina Sandstadt, with me here. Nico has been on the teacher faculty of Yandara for 10 years already. She has trained with influential teachers in many different styles of yoga, such as traditional tantric hatha, yin, restorative, vinyasa, kundalini yoga, just to name a few. Apart from extensive yoga studies, Nicolina holds a degree in physical therapy and has a deep understanding of anatomy and physiology. Nicolina's meaningful teachings and huge depth of knowledge is shared with such a gentle and powerful presence. The pace of her classes feels nourishing and she is just a wealth of knowledge of the ancient teachings. <laughs> Nico, thank you so much for doing this with me. I'm excited. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I really would love to start with the beginning of your journey because as I read, you started at the age of 18. You already felt this calling to leave home and start on this path, the spiritual path. And you arrived at India three times and spent some time there. So would you talk with us please about knowing that you have, there's something bigger and this thirst for knowledge and this curiosity to go look for the information? Mm, yes. I think, um, I, I have always seen myself as a student. I'm from a small town in Sweden and I wasn't exposed to a lot of uh, spirituality growing up. Sweden in general is very like atheist country. Um, in the, you know, certain, you know, part of the tradition to go to the church and certain like holidays or occasions. But in general, I grew up very much like in an atheist family and, um, and no real exposure to meditation or yoga or that type of spirituality, apart from seeing, you know, maybe things on TV or something and, um, having some exposure to relaxation practices in school when I was young, when they did, uh, must've been some research project or study that they did about young children and how mm, deep relaxation would affect their uh, school, <laughs> their school um, and, uh, you know, maybe ability to concentrate, something like that. And I remember really loving those practices where we got to in the middle of the day, lay down in a dark room and we were guided through a sort of meditation or relaxation and I remember it having a really profound effect on me and, um, and that I just felt really good after doing that or during it. And I did go to like some meditations when I was a teenager and like a neighboring town. Um, but there was also not really like a beginner's class or anything. It was just like joining uh, Zen meditation and those you know, 
quite like intense in a way for from not having any knowledge and just like sitting down and being completely silent for uh, a long time without much instruction but still there was something in that that um sparked cur curiosity right and um and i moved to scotland when i was 18 when i finished high school and uh worked there for a while and i also like searched out some meditations while i was there and eventually after about a year of living there me and my friends went traveling to asia which is was kind of very common to do um and mostly to explore and backpack and have a good time but i at the same time was searching out uh, spiritual practices and when we came to sri lanka i read about a meditation center that was on the top of this mountain and that you could go there and do sort of like your own retreat in a way you didn't go for you know specific dates but you could decide when you wanted to arrive and you could stay however long you wanted to so when my friends went to a different part of uh, the country i went to this meditation retreat center and uh, stayed there for it was like a week or 10 days or something and that was had a really profound effect on me and it was really getting up at 4 a.m and bundling up and going to sit in complete silence meditating walking meditation sitting meditation and then every morning uh, i think after the first long sit we had a hatha yoga class with a woman that was i think she was just volunteering to teach classes right in the morning and that was my first experience really with yoga asana practice and i found a really immediate connection to it or like love at first sight and um from that moment wherever i went i would search out yoga classes and different teachers and i took when we came to india of course that's like such you know like the birthplace of yoga so there is so much there and I did a, a long four week intensive yoga training in Rishikesh when I was there, not a teacher training, but like a deepening training into tantric yoga. Um, and when I left India, I moved for a shorter period of time to Barcelona and I connected to a teacher there that I really found inspiring and I went to her classes every day or whenever she taught i would go to the, to her class and um and created like a little yoga community there and i think maybe in a way somewhere in there i was like wow like being a yoga teacher that seems like amazing and i like was looked up so much to the teachers that i had and so i started looking for teacher trainings and i didn't like find anything in India that I was really attracted to going to. And I'd also been to India at that point uh, two or three times and kind of felt like I wanted to maybe explore a different part of the world. And then Yandara kept popping up in my <laughs> Google search. Um, the website was kind of outdated and funky and it didn't like, but something about it spoke to me still and I had this feeling and I, I have always through my life I think really tried to listen to that inner voice when it's calling me to go somewhere and it was really calling me to come here to Yandara to do my teacher training and um, and and I think that was I mean I mean it was an had a huge impact on my life and the feeling that I got from Yandara and from the teachers here was really that such a balanced view of spirituality and like not pretentious or not um, this feeling that you know like other parts of the life are not worth living but really a balanced view of of being uh, experiencing life and that everything is perfect and we are allowed to have you know experiences and emotions and and um, we don't have to feel like everything is you know, it's like the cliche of like love and light all the time or mm -hmm. that it's like everything is welcome and that um, that I think has really uh, influenced my 
path since that moment. And that was in 2006 when I did my first training here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. It's interesting what you're talking about that it's not right. We have this image of a yogi or a spiritual person that they're all the time happy and all the time Zen and, you know, they're just uh, balanced all the time, but that's not true. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, you can easily fool yourself by going into that um, mode of needing to be all uh, love and light all the time. We're all peaceful and happy all the time because in a way it's like you're limiting your experience and maybe even suppressing emotions uh, rather than, you know, which then they can kind of grow under the surface rather mm -hmm. than letting them um, come up to the surface and seeing them and, and experiencing them and then you know, they're part of life as, as all our emotions are part of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that is for me, like very important on my path. I'm, I'm not at all about that feeling that everything should be just happy or light or joyful all the time. Right. We have all sorts of experiences and all of them are equally important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at some point, it can be even hurtful to us to pretend like everything's good when it's not. Exactly. Yeah. And it's also like, you know, we're, it's a little bit, if you think of like social media these days, Instagram or something like people put their, their best self or their best life forward yeah. and just the pictures of everything, like even, um, edited pictures of their face or mm -hmm. uh, the, all the filters, all of these things. And just showing, you know, the corner of your house that's really tidy and clean. Mm -hmm. and yeah. like a lot of this. <laughs> so, um, so in a way we can say that, uh, you know, a lot of us will do the same in our spiritual life of just pretending mm -hmm. that we've got it all together and we're practicing yoga. And so we're, you know, like peaceful and happy all the time, but it's like, you know, it also then I could disconnect you, I guess, from uh, other people and, uh, you know, maybe it even makes other people feel like they're not as successful on their human journey mm -hmm. if they can't be happy and light all the time. And I, I do feel, I do think and see also that there is, like people are getting a bit tired of just seeing that perfect surface. Yeah. So I think that there is you know, another, um, path forward. <laughs> mm -hmm. I yeah. definitely see that people are noticing that actually the way to, um, build a community, the way to connect with other people is not by showing only the best part of yourself, but showing the whole picture and showing the parts of you that other people can relate with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How do you, manage that as a teacher because there is this um when you have a teacher and you really respect them and you respect their journey and all the knowledge that they have it's very easy to put them on a pedestal mm. right and kind of look up to them like there's something that is unattainable yeah yeah that's true um and i think it is important to share um you know the the authentic part of you like for sure the teachers that have been the most inspiring to me are the ones that are the most authentically themselves um and I'm sure that I as a teacher can like this it is something that I'm working on and I want to be get even better at that because it's all it's a place of really vulnerability to show you know all the sides of yourself mm -hmm. for you know as a teacher and for your students I think but but there is, a, there is a balance, I guess, in this, because if you're still, if you have something that you're still working through, uh, I don't necessarily think that you should put that on your student and make them part of your therapeutic inner process so mm -hmm. much, so, but for sure to share when you have gone through something and you're, maybe you're out on the other side and you've learned things from that process, then that's really a gift to share that with with your students or with, with other people. And yeah, it makes it m much easier to connect with the teacher. Yeah. When you think that, when you realize that they're just a human. Yeah. 
right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, we're, we're all uh, struggling with as much of the same things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. find that after so many years of practice, there is a difference with how you go through these issues? Um, yes, definitely. I think part of it just with age and just learning that, you know, life comes in waves, things come and go and, um, and difficult times come and go and not something that we can control always. Um, and we, with practice can learn to invite the, the emotions that arise during those difficult times and sit with them and without getting so caught up in them perhaps like because that is something that we really can do and learn from yoga and, and meditation practice and mindfulness is to to take a step back from those intense emotions and allow not push them back at all but just allow them to be but mm -hmm. without necessarily creating a story around them right because mm -hmm. they're there is a part of our mind that just loves to create a story around our emotions uh, or reactions, right? Something comes up and it will immediately hook onto it and, and say like, yeah, you're feeling like this because that person said that and it's really not fair or you're feeling like this because you're not good enough and you're, you know, like, it's a talking you know bad about yourself or so blaming yourself or blaming someone else so there's that part of our mind that loves to do that and through our practice of mindfulness and, and practice to just witness the mind we can take a step back and we can just notice it all play out and experience it but without necessarily like getting so attached to it and continue you know just, just a downward spiral for a long time yeah yeah We were talking about this before and it was very helpful for me to what you said about changing the perspective that we're not trying to hide from these feelings. Mm. We're learning how to deal with them when they show up. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to um, run away from anything that we're feeling really. Like in Kundalini Yoga, we say that, that emotions are energy in motion. We just... Mm -hmm. It's important. We want energy to move and flow and, uh, and not get stuck anywhere. So we allow them to arise and we're trying not to, um, to like hold on to them so tightly mm -hmm. and, and start to identify with them, which can mm -hmm. happen. Right? Or resist them. Or resist them. Yeah. And exactly. So that's the two ways. Like you can either be too attached to them and then you identify yourself as a person that is angry I am angry mm -hmm. I am I am just this type of person I feel sad all the time I um, or I am sad you know or or you push it away and you say no that's not you know yogic to feel that way so I'm just going to hold on to this feeling of being uh, happy and peaceful all the time and mm -hmm. then you're just suppressing it instead and you're Actually, uh, you're missing out on an important part of the work of being a human. <laughs> mm, let's go into that. <laughs> What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, so we talked earlier about Tantra and I think this is where really, uh, you know, Tantra comes in. Because a lot of the practices in yoga that we do today is from the tantric lineage. And Tantra is all about including everything in life not resisting and um it's like all inclusive inviting all experiences inviting uh, the experiences that you have as a human being in your physical body uh, in this life rather than pushing it away and just focusing on some sort of spiritual um goal all the time right mm -hmm. Uh, or meaning like with the focusing on a spiritual goal that you're trying to push away your sensations or your physical body and just rise above that. So in the tantric path, we're, we're in the human body and we're accepting that and we're uh, allowing things like our emotions, our sensations, our experiences in life to be part of our journey and part of our 
meditation and mindfulness and a part of our practice really mm -hmm. um so that is important that even the shadow parts of yourself have an important role to play in that because you get to know yourself better and you can learn why you are reacting strongly to certain things uh, you know often it's experiences in our past that are influencing our present and our reactions in the present moment in the yoga teachings in patanjali's yoga teachings um, they call them that our feelings and thoughts and are colored right and they're often colored by either likes or dislikes and this comes from an experience in our past when we couldn't maybe process maybe we were so young or we didn't have the tools to process that experiences so so our experience it gets um stored away in our subconscious in the tantric path we incorporate all different parts of our experience into our spiritual path or really our life path you could say because The spiritual path sounds like it's just about spirit, right? It's just about rising above the earthly. And in Tantra, it's more about balancing the two. Um, so it's kind of in a way using that perspective that we can get from the spiritual practices and the spiritual parts where we step away from the mind and we take that place of, of being able to witness our experience And then we use that when we have reactions and emotions and we, we pull on those reactions and emotions and let them be a part of our practice. So mm -hmm. when we have anger come up, we're like, okay, I'm feeling anger. And what's beneath that? Um, you know, is there, maybe there is another emotion beneath it and we can trace that emotion back to a really long time ago, or we can trace the anger back to a certain moment and, It is often moments that from our past when we were young enough or didn't have the tools to process these experiences and instead they get stored away as something just uncomfortable, like we had a threatening or uncomfortable experience. And so when we have an experience that is in some ways similar to that when as adults, we had the same alarm system goes off mm -hmm. and, uh, and they can cause us to have a strong reaction. But if we have the ability to sit back um, and just get a better view of the situation from a, a more a little bit of a distance in our mind mm -hmm. and we get a better overview and we can be like oh, okay like this situation is different because now I have the tools to deal with this and I'm, I'm actually not threatened and mm -hmm. um, and and you know we can just hold space for that emotion and for that Uh, experience from the past and yeah. allow it to dissipate and then really use it as part of our growth right yeah every challenge that comes up every every situation that we maybe even have this thought of why is this happening turning it around and looking at it in a different way as in what has this come to teach me yeah exactly yeah because there's um learning opportunities always and that is like it is what for me the path of yoga is really about it's like it's not just when you step onto your mat and you do your sun salutations and your asana practice or not even about just when you sit and meditate but it's really your whole life can be part of that practice and can be opportunities and there are opportunities to learn all the time in your life from whatever experience you have. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I really love about the way that you uh, taught us during our training about what is tantric yoga. I really connected to your perspective on it because it is really, um, it feels unattainable to be able to shut off the senses like a lot of the yoga lineages uh, instruct us to do or um, maybe even tell us like that's the way to be yeah. a yogi yeah it's really hard to do that especially when we're living in a normal society and what you taught us is about tantric yoga being about all the experience of a human yes mm -hmm. yeah exactly it's it that's exactly it it's like 
it's a practice that is very suitable or a path that's very suitable for householders. And most of us won't be able to go and live in an ashram or a monastery for, um, you know, for, uh, unless we make that choice, right, mm -hmm. for the rest of our lives. Um, so this path is a way of, of yeah, making life as it happens, just making it your practice and making it, inviting it in a way into, to be part of your practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would love to talk with you exactly about this, incorporating the practice, the spirituality, the um, higher versions of ourselves with day-to-day -day life, incorporating all the wisdom that the yogic philosophies have mm. in our life. Yeah. This is something that I work on myself, like in my practice daily. And I think it is probably a lifelong process um, because I too get caught up in uh, the, you know, daily dramas of life. And it's not always easy to step back and take that perspective of, um, of just viewing it from a distance and seeing that there is a, a learning opportunity. But I think, you know, even as we get caught up in it and we have that emotion and we're experiencing it, even if you're in that very moment, don't succeed with immediately stepping back from it. I think that's okay. Like, it, I think it's okay to just have the experience and then be forgiving to yourself and be like, mm -hmm. okay, this came up and now, you know, like even if you had the reaction and you're going through it, you will, with the tools that you're given from your studying yoga and practicing meditation, things like that, you will be able to um, recognize at least afterwards that, oh, like that's why it came up and, and also that it's okay. Cause I think it's easy to, um, to start feeling like we're not doing good enough if we're, if we're having like normal human uh, emotions and reactions. And I think it's important to, first of all, be forgiving and it's okay. Um, you know, things, things come up and uh, we may have reactions and then we can um, see it for what it is. Even if we don't see it until afterwards, that's okay. And like the more we do that, we can catch it faster and faster. Mm -hmm. And even I think, you know, the reactions can come up and you may catch it all the way as like, okay, this is a reaction, but you still want to allow the emotion to be there and really feel it. And the key I think is not to start blaming someone else or yourself. And uh, so the pure emotion itself has its place and you can allow it to flow through and move through you. And what we want to really learn to do is, yeah, not to harm someone else or blame someone else or blame our, ourselves or talk mm -hmm. down on ourselves. Yeah, I think forgiveness here is really the main point because first of all, to forgive ourselves and also to forgive others, right? And surround ourselves with people that when you do a mistake, they don't make you pay for it over and over again. And, yeah. you know, they understand because I had a very big teaching in my life in the last year of, and it came from other people. So it came actually from two students of mine and one of them, you know, everything was always okay. Even if I was late, God forbid, for a class or if I had to change in the last minute, like he was always cool with everything, you know, always going with it. And a different student that every little small thing that I made a mistake on, which of course I made a mistake, you know, like I, I'm always trying my best, but still I make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And every little small thing she made me like, pay for it and made me feel bad about it. And, you know, I, it was, it just was so unpleasant because she wasn't letting me be human. She wanted me to be like this perfect teacher that never makes mistakes. Mm. And just having both of them as reflections of what feels good to me, you know, because I know I'm always doing my best mm. and not always my best is 
I, you know, perfect. Yeah. And having this reflection from two people about how they react. So one of them was forgiving me and not putting too much um, weight on it. And the other one was really making me pay for my mistakes. Yeah. And it made me look at myself about what kind of person do I want to be? Yeah. Do I want to be accepting of someone else when they make a mistake or do I want to make them feel bad about it? Because usually we know when we're wrong. Yeah. Right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And often those two voices, I mean, if they don't come from the outside, they sure come from the, from the inside. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and even, you know, in situations like that, we can also, we can also take it longer and see like, what is like, uh, depending on how, how it makes you feel right. But that person that makes you feel bad about yourself, for example, like look at why, if it's a strong reaction, like why is that reaction coming up? And so then we can take that as our own learning process and, um, and use our practice for that also. Right. Mm -hmm. To see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is, <sighs> it's not always easy in the moment when things are coming up and sometimes it it is like you don't see it until afterwards like I said and I think that's okay you know like we just we just have to be kind to ourselves and, mm -hmm. yeah yeah it starts with ourselves when we mm -hmm. learn to forgive ourselves we also can forgive others yeah yeah mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. so we're talking a lot about practice right? There's a lot of different ways to get to this path. So I'm just curious as your student, how does your uh, personal practice look like? Mm -hmm. So it varies. I don't have like the same routine that I do. And throughout the years, it has varied. And at some parts of my life, I've been very um, strict with my personal practice and almost like religious with my personal practice that I like have to have that hour for yoga every morning. Um, and, and then at other times, like right now I'm doing, I'm, I have like, I like to meditate and this mostly my personal practice these days is meditation either in an active form with Kundalini yoga or just more like a mindfulness type of meditation. Um, sometimes guided, sometimes by myself. And some days I just go for a walk with, um, with my dogs or, or just, um, don't do that kind of traditional type of practice at all. But I do like to have some time for myself in the morning. And that's kind of my Mm, if you say like my minimum, uh, that I, I feel like I need every day to set myself up for success is to have that moment, mm -hmm. quiet moment when, uh, I don't feel, you know, like I'm having to perform or, uh, but just like connect internally and even going for that walk and without having music on or, or a podcast on or, or any, you know, like listening to anything or having my phone with me and just like allowing thoughts to just stream through, come and go and just sort of, uh, cleansing my mind mm -hmm. <laughs> before starting the new day. Yeah. I love that you mentioned about doing it in the morning because it really helps us, as you said, to prepare for the day. I also love what you said about, uh, the active meditations, mm -hmm. uh, Kundalini has, amazing meditations that a lot of them incorporate singing and mantra, which is very helpful for me to center the mind. And actually now there was a Kundalini training here in the last uh, nine days. And really it felt like angels singing and like the place was becoming more pure with every day. It was incredible. And that's something really beautiful about the Kundalini practice. Yes. Yeah. It makes, um, and Kundalini yoga is, it is a very tantric path and very inclusive of emotions and mm -hmm. it's using many different tools, um, for the spiritual practice. Right. So we have like, when we meditate, it's not the, the classical type of meditation where you're just sitting and focusing on the breath, for example, even if that in a certain sense is the goal to be able to have that peace and quietness of mind to be able to just sit and be with your breath and be with, with, um, 
just that inner quietude, if you will. But the tools that are offered in Kundalini Yoga is doing meditation in a more active way so that we give the mind something to do mm -hmm. uh, and work with um, in preparing for that peace and that quietness. So we use a lot of mantra. We use sometimes different breath patterns, mudras, eye focuses, um, and we incorporate these into the meditations. And it, if I find it very, it's a very effective, it's like a stepping stone, right? So rather than going from like active life to just sitting in complete silence and trying to quiet your mind, mm -hmm. it gives you the stepping stones that you're, you can sit and you concentrate your mind on a mantra or, um, whatever it is. And, and that's part of the meditation and it kind of, it, it gives the mind this place to focus for a while. And once the meditation is over, you're much more ready to sit and observe and just feel that peace. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you feel that your practice has affected you personally and your life? That's a good question because mm -hmm. I, it's been part of my life for so long now, um, for like more than half of my life. And, um, it's a very integrated part of my life. And I feel like it, in a way, just mostly it has given me the tools to, um, to stay connected to myself and to stay connected to my essence, I guess, and not be completely just caught up in all the surface, all the things that are going on on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very, I feel, and it's very integrated in my life. And I think I use it even so much more than I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. And like we talked about when emotions come up, when reactions come up, that I am grateful that I have the tools to uh, take a step back and observe and kind of analyze in a way mm -hmm. uh, to see why and, and make that then part of my practice. Why am I reacting like this? Or why is that such a strong reaction or emotion? Yeah. Yeah. Leaving a space between you and the reaction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And also bringing awareness yeah. into it, which I find is maybe in my view is probably the biggest practice of yoga, right? Yeah. Becoming aware yeah. and not ha like letting things happen automatically and reacting automatically or even going to the first thought that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, but being aware of what's happening Yeah. and then choosing Yeah. how we want to react. Yeah. Do we want to go with that thought? Yeah, exactly. We exactly. The more, uh, our awareness, the more awareness we have and ability to, to be aware of all the things that are going on, the more choice we have also within that rather than mm -hmm. our subconscious kind of choosing for us because we're reacting in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I find that, you know, I have things like every human that I'm dealing with and coming up for me. And when I ask the different teachers that are around here, I'm trying to make the most of my time here. Yeah. <laughs> so when I ask what, how do I deal with it? And it always comes down to awareness, become aware yeah. of what's happening. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I was just thinking about it now because, um, you know, we've gone through the whole pandemic. That's been a challenge in itself. And we're just uh, coming out of that. And I feel, you know, very blessed. We've been very blessed here in Mexico. Uh, we're kind of in a remote place. We've been able to be outside and not being, you know, confined in a small apartment somewhere. Um, but it's still been a big, like, collective stress and now going into what's happening in the world right now with uh, war in Europe and it's very like heavy and very dark times. And I find myself pulled into that um, really uh, strongly. And mm -hmm. when I haven't done, and I've, I've noticed this just over the past few days that the first thing I've done in the morning, rather than going out and doing my meditation practice, right? I check 
the news to see mm-hmm. if something, you know, what are the latest developments? Or I turn on the the radio and listen to the radio and just to to hear. And so then it's been so clear to me that it's not setting me up then for the rest of the day to be able to be balanced and in myself. But I've been um, instead, you know, really kind of, it's, I mean, it's, it's feels surreal and a lot of it feels just like uh, hard to take in, hard Mm -hmm. to grasp, hard to understand what's going on. But then this morning when rather than checking the news, I, even in bed, I turned on my meditate, like Kundalini meditation, Mm -hmm. um, mantra. And I did my mantra practice, my meditation practice in bed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I noticed that it was, wow, like it makes such a difference. Mm -hmm. And then I can, I still want to know what's going on in the world. I don't want to, uh, you know, turn off the news completely and just not be aware. I want to be aware. I want Mm -hmm. to know what's going on. Um, I want to, you know, be a part because I, this is, it's affecting everything and everyone to, you know, even if it's far away from Mexico, it's a, still a big shift in the world. And I just noticed so clearly that having that moment of meditation before it really sh- shifts my day a lot. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very true. And actually I did the same today. I, I wanted to come clean to this conversation. So I didn't open any social media yeah. because I am aware that when I do, it affects me. Yeah. And it's our choice what we let into our consciousness. Yeah, exactly. And we can, we can at least, you know, set ourselves up for uh, success. And cause I don't, I really want to say that I don't want to like separate myself from the world and everything mm-hmm. that's going yeah, on. It's like it's important, really important for me. Yeah. To stay connected. And, and I want to, uh, you know, be aware. I am aware there is so much suffering going on and, um, I don't want to shut that out, but I can also set myself up to be, um, able to, receive it in a different way if yeah. I if I do that moment it's not even a long time you know 15 minutes of meditation mm-hmm. 20 minutes something like yeah that. yeah so maybe you would have a word of advice on to all of us that don't really have a lot to do with I mean there is not much that we can do about the situations that are happening how do we deal with that yeah Yes. And what can we do? Yeah. I mean, it's so easy to feel powerless um, because, of course, like we'd want to just like press a button and make it go. Everyone feel peaceful and just stop, you know, stop the whole thing. Um, But the world is playing out as as it is. And a lot of it is outside of our control. So what we can do. I guess is stay grounded ourselves by doing our practices and, um, and then look for ways. Cause I think when we are in that place of, of being more balanced and grounded, we can take in the information in a different way and also hopefully act more, um, more efficiently where we can like okay so what can you really do to help is Mm -hmm. there an organization that you can send money to are there petitions that you can sign um if you're somewhere where you can help refugees that's a wonderful thing to do like there are things that we all can do in a situation like this even if it feels small if we all do it (laughs) it will really create a big effect so Mm -hmm. yeah I love that. Taking a step back, taking time to strengthen ourselves through our practice yeah, so that we have more energy to give. Yeah, because it's not helping anyone to, if I sit, you know, and just like watch the news and feel anxious and scared and uh, panicked, you know, like it's Although like, it's okay. Those moments are there and, and, and it's important to go through that as well. Um, but there are, if we are more, uh, balanced, 
hopefully we can yeah be more efficient and in, in being more uh, taking action mm-hmm. in a more efficient way yeah. yeah and this is also true about our practice in general right a lot of us maybe if we're, we have kids or we have a lot of responsibility we feel like we we don't let ourselves take our time to take this time for ourselves yeah but actually it's so different because when we're full we have more to give exactly yeah, yeah exactly and i don't think that it's you know egotistical to do that i think mm-hmm. also our intention you know we want to fill our cup up like you said so that we have uh, more to give and we can be a better support to other people and a better space holder and Yeah. Hey, I'm quickly interrupting the episode to extend an invitation. If you're interested in deepening into any of the subjects we talk about on the podcast, we offer many different experiences on our beautiful grounds here in Baja, Mexico. From nine-day modules such as sound healing and yoga nidra, to breath and meditation, as well as two or 300-hour yoga teacher trainings, and many different shorter retreats. Check out our website, yandara.com, to see all the information about the different experiences. Let's get back to the episode. I would love to ask you, just changing (laughs) the topics a little bit, Um, throughout this whole journey that you've had, uh, teaching for so long, holding space for people for so long, what is a moment that you're proud of? Hmm. Um... Wow, that's a difficult question. It's funny because I've been, yeah, like I've been a teacher for a really long time and a teacher trainer for a really long time now. And I think I see myself mostly as a student still. And uh, I, yeah, like I am proud of myself for, um, for, like creating these programs here for Yandara and, and like putting together, um, like using all what I've learned from other teachers and putting it together and paying it forwards. Um, but I, I really see myself mainly as a student still, uh, like a student of yoga or a student of life, of life really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. um, But I'm, I've come, I feel like, yeah, I've come a long way. Like I just, just, like I used to be very shy. And like, even if I had this like dream of being a yoga teacher, it was so far away from something that I was comfortable with to be like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I, you know, like anything that had to do with like doing presentations in front of a group would be terrifying for me like my whole life really but (laughs) yeah but then actually like starting to teach and I I did my teacher training and then I didn't start to teach for a long time after I I just kept and I was young when I did my teacher training too I was like 22 and um yeah I didn't start teaching until a few years later I just kept like I did it mainly for my own practice and I had this idea that I wanted to be a yoga teacher at some point, but I didn't feel like I had, you know, enough to share. And I think a lot of it was also that I felt, you know, shy and Mm -hmm. and a bit nervous to be taking that (laughs) role. Like Mm -hmm. I had a lot of the imposter syndrome where where I was going to teach a class and then feeling when I was there, I was like, oh my gosh, like these what are, like who do I think I am <laughs> to tra- yeah, yeah I think every yoga teacher goes through yeah. that <laughs> yeah. but you know I am proud that I've like I've gotten over that and I think that like doing a yoga teacher training and um and then starting to share even if I started really small it really helped me get over that fear of of putting myself there in front of other people and, and as a leader in a way mm-hmm. uh, of a group. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and now of course it's like, I realize like it's sharing something that you love is it's also, that's so different than yeah. having to do a presentation and something in school that you you know, learned yeah. the, the week before. Yeah. yeah. And what I kept telling myself when I was having these thoughts was that there's always somebody that would like to learn what you have to share. Yeah. 
So exactly. maybe you're not going to be teaching somebody who has like all the knowledge in the world and is like very advanced in their studies, but there are people that yeah. would like to have what you have to give. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think, and I try to encourage my students also to just keep, keep learning. because I think, um, that is really key on this path. It's like, yeah. it's infinite, right? You can, there is so much to this, uh, yeah. path of yoga. Yeah. That's really what I was impressed with your teaching is that it's so vast. You draw on so many different lineages. And even when we try to like go deeper and deeper into a subject, you always knew what you're talking about and you would bring up a lot of different resources. And I, I just found that so inspiring. So that's just my yeah. fangirl moment. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I've been blessed also to live. I mean, I did my teacher training here in 2006 and then, um, like half a year later, I came back to Andara and I worked here for about a year and, and mm-hmm. hung out here and I did some administration work for Andara and, and like in exchange for, um, for taking the courses and trainings for the teachers that were teaching here back then. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, and then I went back to Sweden and, I had the experiences I needed to have there and I went to university and you know, opened a yoga studio with some friends of mine for mm-hmm. just for a short time. And then I moved back here in 2012 and then I've lived here for like 10 years. So of course I've had a lot, a lot of time to, to study yoga and to, so the developing these different courses has been like wonderful because I've gotten to really go deep into, um, the studies, right. Mm-hmm. And take workshops and classes and courses with other teachers and and study books and study online courses and so yeah Mm -hmm. I I see myself um very much like a student I'm Sagittarius and I I know like one astrology book that I've read that talks about Sagittarius as being um like gypsy meaning like I think like love to travel and mm-hmm. explore and then student um and then philosophers I feel like I have those like the archetypes pretty strong of mm-hmm. those both I I get fed by exploring new places and traveling I love studying and uh I love like philosophizing and now like sharing um sharing yeah and discussing mm-hmm. and, yeah so how would you advise people to find teachers? Because it's not always easy yeah. to do. I would say to just explore. I mean, that's what I've done. Like I've both, you can get recommendations. I get recommendations from other teachers that I've like, if I like someone's classes, like finding out who they studied mm-hmm. with and, um, and who they got influenced by. And then, uh, and then trying, I mean, we have this opportunity today that's so amazing with all that's accessible online mm-hmm. and the pandemic has made that even more so. So you have actually the opportunity to like sample so many different classes and even the, the, a lot of the online studios and you can just sample and figure out what style that really speaks to you. And, and if you find a teacher that you enjoy, then you know, like see if you can take a workshop with them somewhere or go deeper into studies with them and just let that sort of take you on your journey. And you don't have to learn everything at once. It's like you, we all will find our own way through this. And, um, Mm -hmm. and that's what I've been trying to listen to that inner voice that if there is a practice that like really awakens something in me, like this feeling that just sparks my curiosity and interest. I try to follow that Mm -hmm. and let that take me on that journey. And then that will take me down another path and another path. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Listening to that inner voice. Yeah. So important. Yeah. But also practice. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have a question. It's uh, actually for myself. I'm asking this because it's a question (laughs) that I've, I've been thinking a lot about recently. Yeah. And it also kind of connects to what you were saying with this fear of standing in front of people and being shy and all of that. Do you think we should care what other people think about us? Hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, I think 
there is a yes and a no because caring what other people think um, it can in a way I think help us be kind and respectful and um, and that is of course very important um, like treating others how we want to be treated right um, but and at the same time I think other people don't want us to or speaking for myself like I don't want someone to adjust who they are to me like I want their authentic uh ness or their I want them to be themselves I want them to be you know to share themselves in an authentic way and not to try to uh, change who they are uh, and I find that that makes them much more interesting and mm -hmm. I find like the teachers that I've um, been really drawn to are people that seem just very authentic and um, not necessarily so yogic you know in the way of like and the I don't know what we would say, like a typical yogic person of being like mm -hmm. <laughs> just completely peaceful and happy all the time, but like that they are, you know, like part of life and they watch, you know, things on Netflix and they, whatever it is, you know, they're just like part of this journey and we're all in the journey and mm -hmm. it's not, um, I think it's important. And then of course, like if, the, if you're on, uh, just a very more like, um, spiritual journey and that's your style then you go with that too but mm -hmm. I I enjoy people that are authentically themselves mm -hmm. yeah yeah great so we arrived at our closing curiosity questions cool. <laughs> <laughs> um we'll start with what is something you've changed your mind about Something that I've changed my mind about, um, I think if I look at my journey starting out, um, and this probably has to do with like maturing and growing older also, but it's like going from that place of feeling like yoga is about, you know, being all uh, love and light and peace all the time to being like, no, like yoga is about experiencing life as it is and showing up for the emotions and showing up for the hard times and the easy times and um and holding space for all of that mm -hmm. so it's not about like rising above and coming to this place of being all peaceful and happy all the time but it's like it's just about coming to a place of being open to experiencing everything and showing up for mm. uh for everything as it's as it's coming at us <laughs> beautiful yeah what is something you didn't think you could do and you did um well, i guess i would come back to that almost like this feeling of being a leader and i would say leader in the sense of like teaching a class and like in that moment as a teacher you're sort of like stepping into that role you're putting yourself in a place of of being a leader and I never felt much like a leader when I was younger or growing up mm. or even in the beginning of my like yoga career. Uh, so that's something that has, uh, yeah. I, Can you share a little bit about <laughs> the inner process that you went through with not feeling like you are a leader to becoming a leader? Mm -hmm. I think there is a shift. There was a shift. It's actually, I think, something that Christopher told me um right around the time like around 2012 when I was moving back here to become a teacher and it really had something to do with being authentically me and that was such a liberating thought that I up until that moment felt like you know I had to in a certain sense embody my teachers when I was teaching or I had to step into a certain role, my yoga teacher role, or like being that in a certain role and like shifting that idea of like, I actually don't, like I have to only share from an authentic place and I don't have to step into a role or try to accommodate other people, but I, 
And I think that in that moment, it shifted something. It was like, okay, like I, I don't have to care so much about mm -hmm. uh, how other people see me. I can just share from my uh, heart and my experience. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. don't have to try to be something that you're not. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. What gives you hope? Mm -hmm. I think it's been very clear for me uh, over the the past few days in this um The times are difficult with the war that's just started and uh, it's very heavy and it's hard to comprehend uh, that when these things are happening in the world and and they do happen and this is not the first time, will probably not be the last time and it is, there is a, a lot of polarity um, and uh, a lot of uh, heaviness and and at the same time there is so so it's like we see that the the heavier side of it and the horror of what's happening and then at the same time it's like wow then all these people are getting together and and donating money like never before and people are driving down to Poland to get refugees and bring them back to their homes and they're donating a lot of uh, you know things that are needed and um, countries are getting together and and uh, and um, working together and coming up with solutions together much faster than the normal process would be. And these things, you know, even in the midst of the, the heavy and horror that, that of the times, there is also the other side of it. And so I think that gives me hope that there is The polarity is there, but like, I feel like that the light will win. <laughs> Life will I love win. love that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Life always wins. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you define happy? Uh, I define happy as content mm. and um, meaning like, not as bliss or ecstasy or a feeling of being this high on, uh, on good feelings, but just as being content with the way things are, um, and at peace. So, mm. yeah. Beautiful. Mm. What are you curious about right now? Hmm. Right now I'm curious about I'm curious about my next path in life. I think I, you know, I've been here for 10 years doing not the same thing, of course, like I've evolved a lot during the 10 years, but I feel like I'm in a place in my life where I'm ready for uh, a shift and something, you know, new to happen. And I'm not exactly sure what it is. Mm. we're uh, looking at teaching more trainings in Europe and I'm hoping that that will manifest and maybe that's a shift to, you know, be here for part of the year, be there for part of the year and, um, and just, yeah, that let life and the next 10 years unfold. Mm. <laughs> Great. So how can listeners stay connected with you? Um, well, They can follow me on Instagram. I'm not the most active person, but I do post occasionally and um, uh, and and I do post things, of course, like for when we have programs and trainings that I'm a part of, I usually post them on my Instagram page. And also through the end of our newsletter, uh, we have, we always post any courses, anything new that's coming up through our newsletter. So mm -hmm. those would probably be the easiest way. Great. To stay Or they can come visit you here yes, in beautiful Mexico. Of course. Yes. I, we have trainings here all year round pretty much. And uh, I teach mainly, so I teach some of the 200 hour programs Some here in Mexico, I teach one in Sweden, one new program in, in Italy, 200-hour mm. program also in Sicily and Italy. So I'm very excited about that. And and also love teaching in Sweden in the summer. Um, but then I do teach uh, the long 300-hour immersion program here mm -hmm. in Mexico. 
and also the Kundalini yoga module and the breath and meditation yoga module. And those, those I love so much. It's really, um, I feel really blessed to just get to dive into those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of options. Yeah. A lot of options. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Nico, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it was really an, an honor and a pleasure. Mm, thank you. Yeah. It was really wonderful to have this moment with you. Now, after this time to nurture your mind and your spirit, we invite you to take a moment to consider others. A kind wish might come to mind. Know that what we learn becomes more valuable when we apply it and share it with others. So share this episode on Instagram stories, tag Yandara and I, or share with a loved one so that more people can benefit from it. Our hope is that the search will lead you home to who you already are, to what was always there. We'll be back next week with more inspiration, honest conversation, and insight into the energetic world around us. Thank you for listening and watching.